Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. In this episode, we are talking about four movies that are out right now. We're talking about Maestro, Rebel Moon, A Child of Fire, Part 1, Aquaman, and The Lost Kingdom, and a little Wonka. Yeah, we're going to talk about all four of those. So let's get on with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson, and I am the Hollywood Outsider. I am the one. I am Neo, if you will. If you've never listened before, do not judge this podcast on this episode because I am usually joined by my co-hosts, but everybody's off. Literally everyone's off. So you get to hear me ramble and tell you what I thought of four specific movies. I didn't want to end the year without talking about some of the biggest movies that have come out. And while the other hosts were willing to to come back and do some conversations on it, it's just not fair. They wanted to enjoy some time off, so have at it. I obviously have nothing else to do but to talk to you guys. So I hope everyone's doing I'm Aaron Peterson. If I didn't say, how the hell are you? How's the end of your year? Are you ready for 2024? Because I sure am. I'm I'm about done with this year. Oh, it's had a couple rough weeks. Let me tell you, I, nobody wants to hear about that right now. But here's what I want to do. I want to talk about King the Conqueror is being recast. You saw, I'm sure. If you've been following any kind of entertainment news, Jonathan Majors has been let go from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So that entire Kang Avengers play out that they were building is going to either have to be recast, which they still have a writer attached to the movie, or they're going to have to go somewhere else, go to Dr. Doom or something. But Jonathan Majors was found guilty on a couple of misdemeanor assault charges. And because of that, Marvel decided to go a different way. They've got, I'm sure, a little... A little too much negative press as of late, and I just want to move past it. A friend a friend of mine recommended a really wild solution, which is to get Robert Downey Jr. back into the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you know? But not as Iron Man, as Kirk Lazarus from Tropic Thunder. Only he would be playing Kang. And I'm like, this could be a brilliant cameo if Marvel really wanted to do it. You can't do the whole movie that way. Because the world can't handle that. But a cameo and like a reference, I don't know. I think I think that could that could work. And only Robert Downey Jr. could do it. No one else should even try. I don't know. The, the whole thing is just <sighs> chaotic. <laughs> All right. I'm, I shouldn't laugh at my own jokes, but I'm going to. Chaotic? Come on. That's funny. Anyway, so we don't know what they're going to do <laughs> with Kang the Conqueror. But Jonathan Majors has been conquered in terms of this situation there's no winners here. I mean, the fans lose, the majors loses, Marvel loses. I think everybody is just, you know, we got to move past it. Vin Diesel apparently just got accused of some nastiness, uh, sexual assault. I don't know what's going on with that. Of course, he and his team deny the charge. It, it, read up on that. We don't talk about that stuff on the show. It's just been a crazy couple of weeks where some pretty big stars have taken some pretty big hits. <sighs> that doesn't mean there aren't great movies out, though. And this is the time of year when you get some big ones. So we have to talk about Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. It's the last DCEU movie, you know, the, the DC Extended Universe. The last one, it's done. It's not coming back. You're not restoring it. Stop getting these weird hopes up to go to Netflix or something like the WB's not going to sell it to Netflix. That's a wild idea that, of course, Zack Snyder is stoking the flames up. But we've got that one. Wonka. I can't wait to talk about Wonka a little bit. I know it's already out, but I still want to talk about it because it's so much better than I even expected. And uh, Rebel Moon, A Child of Fire, part one, because we need the longest title possible for the Star Wars reenactment. <laughs> but let's start with let's start with Maestro, because I feel like Rebel Moon is a perfect segue to Aquaman because, you know, Snyderverse. I'm sure there's a there's probably some kind of Easter egg that connects all of them. So Maestro is on Netflix right now, and that is, man, it's it's quite a film. It's a towering and fearless love story chronicling the lifelong relationship between Leonard Bernstein and Felicia Montalegra, uh, Cohn Bernstein. It's a love letter to life and art. This is the description, and it's basically a lot more involved in regards to the relationship, it's more about that love story. And I thought it would be more about Leonard Bernstein becoming the composer extraordinaire that he was, but that's not 
the way that they wanted to go. And it's on Netflix right now. It's already there. Just dropped. And this is Bradley Cooper's just love letter to cinema and music. He has been working on this apparently for six years. And he wanted to tell this story. And I feel like most of the general audience probably won't know Leonard Bernstein, but you know his music. West Side Story, obviously, is is a big one. But he has many other accomplishments in terms of conducting. And he, he just lived an interesting life. He was a bisexual man. He had many gay lovers. But he married Felicia often reported as the only woman he's ever loved. And they had a very complicated relationship. They had several kids. They had a a long life. Um, And the stars of this film are Bradley Cooper and Carrie Mulligan. You may remember her from Promising Young Woman. And Carrie Mulligan crushes this as Felicia. She is just, she's a woman who is headstrong, smart, independent, knows what she wants understands the man that Leonard is and how complicated the situation is for their relationship and still supports him, even though they have obviously ups and downs and Bradley Cooper really, really gets into his part. I mean, and there's been a lot made of the fact that he used a prosthetic nose, but if you've seen Leonard Bernstein, I, I feel like he's just trying to bring Leonard Bernstein to life and it does. And it really doesn't stand out. In fact, I will say Though I think Carrie Mulligan gives the better performance here. Like her Felicia is multi-layered. It is, it is, there are parts that are tragic, parts that are beautiful, parts that are exciting. She just really gives a career making performance. She already has a career, but it could still take her to a different level. Bradley Cooper's already at that different level, you know? Um, But one thing about Bradley Cooper is if you've seen the trailer, if you've seen the previews, you get this... (laughs) It's easy to get lost in his voice because he's he's trying to talk like Leonard Bernstein, and it has a it's very nasally um, type of voice, and it it's very close to how Leonard Bernstein sounded. So it's not like he's making fun of him or being exaggerated or anything like that. He's trying to replicate the, the person that he's playing, and he does a very wonderful job. Because five minutes into the movie, I stop seeing Bradley Cooper. That's hard to do. Bradley Cooper is not an easy guy to not see. He's a good looking dude. If you didn't know, very, very handsome fellow. And he does a wonderful job. I, I'm very impressed. The, the screenplay is by Josh Singer and Bradley Cooper. The one thing I will say in particular to the film Maestro, it's a little disjointed. It has that, that biography effect where they jump and bounce around from timeline to timeline And it becomes very, very difficult to understand or ascertain exactly where in this specific timeline, where in this person's life, whether it be Leonard or Felicia, where are we at? Why are we at this point? Did we miss large chunks of story? And I find this interesting because, I mean, people are raving like crazy about Maestro and there's a lot to rave about. And I've I've talked about two points. I'll, I'll bring up another one in a minute. But if you go... Like, go to another film, another genre. Go to Rebel Moon, right? Zack Snyder's movie is getting a lot of, just a lot of hate and loathing because they say that it's missing story elements or it feels like we're jumping from plot point to plot point. This, whenever it's a heavy drama, nobody seems to give a shit. But if it's something that's genre focused, then it's a big problem. I just, I can't get on board with that as an argument. This is a much bigger issue for me than Rebel Moon was. I understood everything that was flowing in Rebel Moon. This, and I'm not trying to compare the two, okay? Maestro is a much better crafted film in a different way. It's, it's a, it, obviously they're different kinds of films, but there are big jumps, like big gaps. And it doesn't explain where we are. And it can be confusing if you're not really pay, either paying attention or you know the characters in depth. And that is a problem, I think, with the screenplay. I can't see it winning best screenplay. I just, I just can't. I can see it winning best director. Bradley Cooper feels like he's been chasing this Oscar for a long time. He's actually got a lot of nominations. He's been a producer on films and whatnot. Star is born. Obviously is the, is the film of note people will bring up, but he's a very talented all around filmmaker. He's not just an actor. He's not just a writer. He's not just a director. He's very talented all the way around. This is impressive. It's impressive filmmaking. I, though I like Oppenheimer better as a movie, I would say that Maestro is better directed. I said it. Sorry, Chris Nolan. I know you're selling the 
Blu-rays like mad, but I think this is better directed. There are some scenes that are so fantastic. It blew my mind that this was Bradley Cooper. It's a second film that he's directed. Blew my mind. He has elements where, because you're dealing with, uh, Felicia was an, was an actress. She's very theatrical. Leonard was a, a very loving person. He loved people. He loved, and he loved music. And when he is conducting or when he's around music, he just, he has a, his entire personality just burst from the seams. It's just nothing but joy. It's just come s- seeping out of his pores. And that comes through in the way that the film is shot. And there are so many just really clever segues or allusions to where, how the relationship is going or uh, the career uh, of Leonard or, or Felicia. And it's done through musical touches. Um, it's hard to describe without you actually, it's something you have to see, but the music carries you through the film. It almost feels like you're, you're, you're on a song sheet. Like you're just flowing with, um, the musicality of it all and the transition pieces really flourish. You will go from one section of a building to another section of the building and it all feels fluid and beautiful and sweeping shots and just beautiful seamless transitions that capture both black and white because it's reflecting the earlier times of their lives and that's a reflection of the time of cinema and uh, the time of music at that time to the the modern the more modern times which are in color and that all these things just flow and blend and just move like a like an ocean just beautifully just flow i really was impressed by so many of these and they were staged so beautifully there's a, a couple scenes where you have leonard and felicia as they especially as there's a relationship is burgeoning and they're just demonstrating that they've been in this relationship for a time but they don't really have time to explain the ups and downs and you just it's done through a theatrical performance and, but it doesn't feel forced. It feels like a natural flow. It feels like a musical. It feels like a West side story bit. I just, I, I really love the direction. I was so impressed with the direction. Again, I just had some issues with the story elements and how it, they connect pieces of the story without really explaining necessarily how some of those pieces flow. Uh, that's all I want to say about Maestro. I kind of want to move on to Wonka, but j- just, you know, Maestro, very good film. Not one of my favorite of the year, sad to say, but uh, I've got a pretty eclectic choices in my head. I just, I really, my taste is very eclectic. So again, I'm not editing this episode. So if I, blah, 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 I don't know what to tell you. You're going to have to deal with it. Uh, but a ten dollars the full price permission. I give Maestro seven bucks. I do think it's worth watching, and I really recommend. It. It's on Netflix. You have no reason not to watch it, and don't be turned off by the black and white. It really, really flows with the story that they're telling, and the performances are that good. There's a couple of really um, great supporting performances. Matt Bomer's in here. He's really good. Sarah Silverman is in this and completely disappears into her role. Shows that she is a very talented actress as well. There's a lot of of wonderful performances and beautiful direction in the film. The score, obviously, which takes a lot of uh, pull from Leonard Bernstein. The music is obviously, the score is obviously wonderful as well. Now, Wonka. Oh, my God. If you haven't read my review, let me paraphrase. Timothée Chalamet. It's actually pronounced Timothée. Did you know that? Because he's French. But some people want to call him Timothy. I'm just going to call him Chalamet because that's going to make this move a little little faster. Well, he stars as the, as the titular Willy Wonka, an up-and-coming chocolate maker desperate to make his mark, selling the most glorious confections people have ever tasted. Now, that's quite a lofty goal in a world where chocolate seems to be actual currency. I'm not kidding. They refer to chocolate basically like money. Like, you can barter with chocolate. I'm pretty sure if you went to the strip club, you could you could tip with chocolate. It's weird. Uh, but anyway, so... Uh, Candy's currently being monopolized by this hidden chocolate cartel that's headed up by three shady businessmen that, that are secretly working in tandem. They're played by Matthew Bainton, Patterson Joseph, and Matt Lucas. Oh, and they have a chocoholic chief of police in Keegan-Michael Key. <laughs> He's actually it, firmly in their back pockets, and the more they bribe him, the bigger he gets. All right, well, almost immediately after he gets there, as he's trying to hawk his chocolate... Wonka finds himself tricked into a laundry servitude scam thanks to Mrs. Uh, Scrubbit, who's played by Olivia Coleman, and she's wonderful in this, as she always is. 
and her lovelorn compatriot Bleacher, who's played by Tom Davis. Uh, he's really teetering on over the top, but he never quite gets there. So these two together, they they are very very um, fun together. They're like a yin and yang. Now, owing an insurmountable debt, Willie then partners up with several other entrapped souls a young orphan named Noodle and several other ones, and also a uh, curmudgeonly Oompa Loompa, played by Hugh Grant. And they basically have to to enact a heist to get out of Scrubbit Cellar, sell some chocolate, and get out of debt and wipe their slates clean. That's that's the whole movie. It's an interesting storyline, but I got to say, man, I went into this movie wanting to hate it. Not hate it, but I didn't care. I just didn't care. Did you see the uh, Johnny Depp? Wonka, Willy Wonka. That was weird. That was not a good movie. And I don't know what Johnny Depp was doing, but it was bad. I was not enjoying that. I didn't really love the Gene Wilder version. I know. I don't hate me all you want, but I grew up with it. I thought it was good. I didn't understand all of the love other than pure imagination. What a wonderful song, which gets worked into this movie, by the way. What? Yes, it does. Oh, it's so good. It breaks my heart. But I didn't, I, I didn't feel walking into Wonka that I have the reverence for the original film that so many other people do. I just didn't feel like I had it. But man, while I'm watching it and pure imagination, I realize as soon as I hear the words pure imagination, I'm like, oh, I have nostalgia here. I didn't realize I even had. There's so much nostalgia anymore. I mean, I figure like I got to have it for everything. I did not have it for Wonka until I was in this movie. This maybe it restored it. Maybe Johnny Depp chased it away or scared the hell out of it with whatever the hell that was. I don't know. But Timothy <laughs> Timothy Chalamet is so good. He is so good. But I'm coming back to him because at the helm of of Wonka is Paddington director Paul King. He also co-wrote the script with Simon uh, Farnaby. Man, uh, Paddington. The Paddington movies. If you haven't seen them, they are wonderful family fair. But that didn't mean that I understood why he was making a Willy Wonka movie. And we just had one a few years ago. Do we need another one? I didn't know, but I went into this saying, all right, I'm going to give it a fair shot. Ended up loving it. The set pieces are just fanciful and wonderful. And there's a lot of whimsy and, and beauty along the way. The set design is fantastic and fantastical. I mean, it looks like you're living in this, world that doesn't exist and also can i move to a place where i can barter with chocolate because that sounds a little bit of an amazing thing just a little bit uh they have it's a musical if you didn't know this is also a musical full-fledged musical this is not a talkie it's not a talkie uh the, the original songs are written by neil hannon there's a toe tap and score by joby talbot all of these things really, really work. It creates this chimerical feel. It's a, a beautiful universe. I really, really came to love it. It's very old fashioned. The energy is high, which is Paul King's specialty. Uh, the pacing is is perfect, and it really balances that that dynamic that I think musicals always have to kind of walk a tightrope with, which are the talking sections and the musical sections like they have to flow there has to be a, a rhythm and a cadence to all of it it has to feel lyrical it has to feel smooth to really work and this is the best one i've seen since the greatest showman and it has a very greatest showman feel so i'm telling you right now if you love the greatest showman like i do oh and i do <laughs> i've seen that movie way too many times then you will love wonka if you hate it the greatest showman, then you probably don't like fun. You just don't, you don't like it. Hey, and that's, that's your right. You know what? You're going to like Rebel Moon better. <laughs> that's going to be more for you. If you don't like fun, I can't help you there. But I also think it's a great family movie, great holiday movie. Although so is the holdovers, which I recommended a couple episodes back. Also that's coming to Peacock on the 29th. So check out for that. But yeah, Wonka, so good. Just so good. And Chalamet is fantastic. He is the thing that makes this work. I am not a big Chalamet fan. I, I like him enough, but in Dune, he bored the hell out of me. I haven't really liked him a lot in heavier dramatic roles, but here I don't, he's delicious. He is just, he, he's fun and 
just enjoyable and engaging. And he, he feels it's infectious. His joy in the movie as Willy Wonka is infectious. He just captivates us. He captivates the characters all around him. Like he's changing the emotions of everyone he comes in contact with. He is very much a showman. He is very much in the same vein as Hugh Jackman in The Greatest Showman. You know, he's just wandering, try, walking around trying to win people over to his idea and also sell his chocolatey wares and maybe possibly see his mother again in spirit. It, there's a lot of things going on and Chalamet captures all of it. I can't tell you how much I love this. I was shocked absolutely shocked how much I loved Wonka. So Wonka is pure imagination. Absolutely. It's full of joy and whimsy. It's a creative origin story. You never knew you wanted, but you're going to be delighted to have witnessed because I'm sick of origin stories too. I really am. I'm with you, but this is great. This is absolutely great. Chalamet floats on air and this is probably his most charismatic performance that I, that I have seen. And it's a rousy musical wonderful songs, a cast who came to play and have a great time. This is going to dominate the box office. I guarantee it. It's going to be one of the biggest hits of the winter. If $10 is the full price of admission, I give Wonka nine bucks. I really loved it. Absolutely loved it. It'll make my top 10 list. Spoiler alert before we even get there. Whew. That was a lot. I really miss having people here to talk to. You guys, you guys still hanging in? We're going to play a game called, can you make it to the end? All right. And if you make it to the end, I want you to to reach out to me on, you know, X or Twitter or whatever or Facebook at buy popcorn at the Hollywood Outsider, whichever place you put threads, whatever, wherever you find us. Let me know you finished this episode and I'm going to do a shot for every person that does that. Every person that that shares this episode saying I made it to the end. I'm doing a shot this holiday season just for you. So now you got that in mind. You can also do a shot every time there's slow motion in Rebel Moon, A Child of Fire, Part 1, longest title. Just why does it need to be this long, Zack Snyder? Why? It's kind of like, why do you need a director's cut of a movie that just came out? Why are you advertising that? Let's talk about that before we talk about the movie, okay? <sighs> heavy sigh. I guess it's kind of like why say heavy sigh when I just heavy sigh, but what are you going to do? What is the deal with this, if you haven't been paying attention to the entertainment news, Zack Snyder and Netflix are now talking about, hey, I'm going to release an R-rated cut of this. It's going to be better. I have a better R-rated cut in the near future after part two comes out in March. If you have a better cut, and I like Zack Snyder, okay? Don't lump me in with, oh, I hate Zack Snyder. I like Zack Snyder. I am not one of the, I'm not a cultist either. Like they keep referring to people that are fans or cultists now. I mean, can't you just be a Zack Snyder fan? I am. I wanted the Snyderverse restored because I liked those movies or some of them, not all of them. <sighs> Boy, just wait until you get to Aquaman. Um, if you have a better cut, if you have the best movie possible, why is that not the movie we're seeing? And don't get me wrong. I like Rebel Moon. I'll, I'll get a, a little bit ahead of it. I liked it. I, I think some of the negativity is not earned. I, I feel like there are there's definitely at this point a certain amount of people that are going to poo poo this movie because Zack Snyder directed it alone. Now, is that fair? Absolutely not. I've read numerous reviews from top critics. Now I am a rotten tomato proof critic, so I take it very seriously. I really do. I, I take that very seriously. We had a whole episode on that a month or two back. Go find it. I'm not going to repeat myself. I take that very seriously. If you are a critic and you're referring to Zack Snyder cultus in your review, you are already biased. You, you already have bias. You are already kind of rigging your own review to some degree. Does that make sense to, to the people listening? I, I do not think that's right. I do not think as a critic that is right. That is not what we're supposed to be doing as critics. That said, sir... <laughs> What you shouldn't be doing as a filmmaker is putting out a PG-13 version of your movie and then promising an R-rated one that's supposed to be better. What kind of shit is that? That's shitting on your fans. If there's a better version already available, put that out. We understood as fans what went on with the Zack Snyder um, Justice League cut. That is an anomaly. 
It should not be a marketing ploy. And that's what it's being made into. That's a marketing department using us, the fans, to market their movies for. They're trying to, instead of an organic social revolution, if you will, like the the Zack Snyder Justice League situation, they're trying to create that. They are trying to create Barbenheimer. That's what they're trying to do. But they're trying to do it themselves as, bo- as opposed to it being organic. <sighs> Man, just give me the best movie, the best option. Now, this is a part one of two. It, it is part one of two. And it's very much a Magnificent Seven, uh, Seven Samurai kind of thing, where they're just getting a team together to take on an insurmountable foe. But the movie Rebel Moon, it's a sci-fi epic. It's basically in the vein of Star Wars, Chronicles of Riddick, a lot of that. And when a peaceful colony on the edge of a galaxy finds itself threatened by the armies of a tyrannical ruling force, Korra, played by Sophia Botella, she's she's this mysterious stranger living among the villagers, and she becomes their best hope for survival because she's got a secret past. Don't worry, they'll tell you. I'm not going to spoil anything, I promise. There's nothing... That isn't already spoiled in the trailers. Tasked with finding trained fighters who will unite with her and making an impossible stand against the mother world, Korra assembles a small band of warriors, outsiders, insurgents, peasants, and orphans of war from other worlds who share a common need for redemption and slash or revenge. As the shadow of an entire realm bears down on the unlikeliest of moons, a battle over the fate of a galaxy is waged, and in the process... A new army of heroes is formed. It was directed by Zack Snyder. It was written by Shea Hatton, Kurt Johnstad, and Zack Snyder, of course. Stars uh, Sophia Batella, Jim Hansu, uh, Ed Screen, Michael Huisman. Huisman? I always get his name wrong. But it's okay if you misspell Huisman, <laughs> I think. I don't know. And you should know if there's any hesitation that this was actually a plot pitch to Kathleen Kennedy and the people over there to make a Star Wars movie. So Zack Snyder actually wanted this to be a Star Wars movie. And they said, whoa, Edgelord, this is too much. We can't do it. It is way too dark for Disney, the the Disney you, because we've got our own plans to mess up our universe. We do not need you coming in here and doing that for us. Also, Palpatine's still alive. Didn't you hear? It, this is very much Star Wars. Okay, this is the, there's a galactic empire. There are people on the ground trying to get things going and revolt against this evil empire that is threatening to destroy their entire way of existence. It is 100% Star Wars. It just has a different name. And that name is Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire. That's actually the official title. It's weird, though. I keep saying it backwards. I'm sorry. <sighs> Rebel Moon. All right, so let's talk about it. I like this movie. I know critics are just trashing it, but again, I've I've seen a lot of those reviews where they're referencing the the Zack Snyder cult. Man, look, I, I get that there are people that are way too extreme about stuff out there. You start talking down to them, it's hard for me to take your review seriously. So I'm just going to give you my review. I think this is a fun, rather dark, but I think you expect that when it's Zack Snyder, right? But so it's not a fun, zippy sci-fi epic. It's meant to be a a heavier, but not dour sci-fi epic. Like, it's fun in some parts, but it's mostly just an, an engaging, entertaining film with characters that I enjoy and actors that I really enjoy. I mean, Charlie Hunnam's in here, and I, I really like Charlie Hunnam. I mean, he doesn't really do anything special other than his normal Hunnamness, but I like Charlie Hunnam. I like who he is. I really like Sophia Batella. I, I think she's as our lead, as our entry point into this new universe, I guess. Um, you know, she's somebody I can get behind and you, you need to have a leader that you can follow. And I like this aspect of it, right? So yes, we are totally ripping off star Wars. I'm sorry. Paying homage <laughs> to star Wars. There's laser swords. They're not lightsabers. They're laser swords. Um, There are guns that are definitely pew, 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 pew. So that definitely happens. But we don't have the Luke Skywalker scenes. You know, we don't have where we have to train someone to be a badass. She's already badass. She's just a badass in hiding. You know, she's trying to lay low and and live her best life. And she's got a complicated backstory. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but 
there's a lot of interesting backstory here where you she has more going on than what you've seen and it's going to play into the second film which comes out in March though this one does have a definitive ending so it's not like a massive to be continued it really ends on a okay all right I want to see more kind of kind of matter um, but no she's very good she's a very capable lead I really enjoy her charisma and pulling the team together and, and moving forward and how people come to follow her. Uh, there, there's a character called Belisarius who is really the, I don't know, kind of the, the Darth Vader slash Palpatine of the story where it's the overarching villain that we don't really see a lot of, but obviously it's going to be a much heavier force in the next film. I look forward to getting more of the backstory there. Uh, the mother world is basically the empire. It is really similar, uh, but, but I will say the, the vibe felt more. If you guys saw Chronicles of Riddick, is it, can I still mention Vin, Vin Diesel movies? I don't know what the rules are on, on this, you know, I don't want to get canceled, but if you saw Chronicles of Riddick, it's a mix between that kind of aesthetic and star Wars. So star Wars is much more fun, family friendly, zippy. Uh, let's just have fun adventures. Chronicles of Riddick was much darker and dour, but had uh, kind of, you know, those rebels, those the Han Solo's of the world collectively, as opposed to just a side character. And that's what this movie is. It's a, it's a, a gaggle of Han Solo's without too much snark. And if I had to, if I had to point to anything that the movie's missing, it's a, it's a deeper sense of humor, which I often find missing in Zack Snyder's movies. It just seems like he doesn't incorporate a large, amount of humor into his his films i know he's got some don't come at me but it's not it's not heavy and it's i, I think like chronicles of riddick had had more clever snark and more retort and whatnot and here i think the movie could use more of that a little bit more levity now and again otherwise it just feels too heavy uh ed screen is the main villain atticus noble uh the main like lowercase villain right there's the big villain that we don't get much of the the Voldemort, if you will. And then we've got the, for this particular story villain and that's Ed screen. And he's, he's good. If you've seen him be a villain in pretty much everything he's done, you've seen him be a villain. It's the same character. He's done it before. That's not really a, a standout in any way, shape or form. Um, it, it's a, it's a good film. It's not great. It's not a masterpiece. Anybody that says it's a masterpiece, those are probably the cultists. <laughs> I don't know if there's still some out there. It's not a masterpiece, but it is a really entertaining, engaging film. And I do feel like Zack Snyder gets a lot of flack. On the same token, oh man, I, I love you, Zack, but you also stoked those flames. And I get it. It helped make his made his dream movie come true. Why wouldn't you engage with those people who love you? Like People don't get mad when other filmmakers and stars and whatnot engage with their fan base. I don't know why he gets caught with so much of it now i'm not going to forgive the pg-13 but i've got a better version that's r-rated i'm not forgiving that i think that's a bullshit move that's a that's what i like to call a dick move i don't like that move i think that's not fair to the fans that you know you love Zack snyder if you're listening which i sure you have better things to do i don't like here watch this but i've got a promise of a better one coming just give me the best one give me the best version which obviously is not this one but I had no problem following the story. I really had no problem being engaged with the characters. I really dug all of the actors involved. There's nobody that really bugged me or, or stood out as anything negative. Um, you know, I, I like some of the world building that's happening here. You're hearing more about uh, Princess Isa uh, and and some some possible magical properties. Maybe there's more of a fantastical element that'll come in in the future. Uh, we we get a little bit more of the old king because basically the because the mother world has basically taken out the old king and now they're ruling the galaxy and there there's a lot of factors going on that I don't really want to get into because I really care about your experience I don't want you to be spoiled but this is a setup movie there's a lot of setup this is it is very obvious when you get to the end we have more to go and you are getting more you're getting more in March. But there's a lot of stuff I loved in here. Uh, creative creature designs. It was like a mix between Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, the practical effects of Lord of the Rings. I mean, there's really a nice mix of that. 
the CGI feels real and grounded, even though they're out of this world with the design, it feels real. It feels better. Special effects are much better than like say Aquaman were. There's a kick-ass spider fight with laser swords. Love that. We can't call them lightsabers. Don't you do it. Don't you do it. But also kind of, I, I want to do it. <laughs> I want to call them lightsabers. <laughs> Fucking lightsabers. There's no joke. They are definitely lightsabers. Whatever. I do think the characters are a bit thin, right? The characters are a bit thin and they do, they kind of like round them up very, fairly easily. And that, that's probably where people are complaining that, well, there's missing scenes because of this magical R-rated version. And maybe that's the case. I don't know. I haven't seen it. We haven't seen it. We're still waiting on this thing. But the characters uh, that join up, there, there's enough to understand who they are and where they are in, in the system, where they are in this particular construct. So I can enjoy the movie. I don't have a problem with it. Some people have a very big problem. Some people love to tout that Star Wars apparently is so much deeper than it is, and it's just not the case. You know, you've had decades to adjust to the Star Wars movies. You just saw Rebel Moon. And plus, it's a part one. If you haven't heard, it's a part one. There is a part two. To me, he is basically saying this is a connected universe and you have to see both films for it to be a complete experience. Now, they chose not to put it out that way. So that's the way it came out. I don't know what to tell you. I will reserve judgment until I see part two to really put all of those pieces together. But in terms of what I saw, I had no problems following the story. It wasn't an issue. And people that say they have an issue, I feel like they walk in already wanting to dislike it because of who made it. There is very much that piece of uh, the pie in existence. Zack Snyder's just got a revolution against him. He's the galactic empire. Who knew? You know, but I, I really, I enjoyed the world building, the team bonding that's starting to come together. There's, there's a couple twists along the way. Uh, one that I should have seen and I didn't shame on me. I smacked my own face and ass at the same time. It was very weird and uncomfortable, but I did it. But I enjoyed the film overall. Like I, I really, I really dug it. This is a cool world building exercise, and I can't wait for the R-rated version, which is apparently is awesome, according to Zack Snyder. Not as awesome as this for sure. Who is making these decisions anyway? So I've ten dollars full price admission. I give. Let me take a breath. <sighs> Rebel Moon: A Child of Fire Part One now available on Netflix. <sighs> Jesus, I give it seven bucks. I really enjoyed it. And I kind of like that Snyder has found a, a home at Netflix. And I also love there's a great transition because, you know, uh, Zack Snyder and J.J. Abrams both have a thing with lens flares. They just love lens flares. There's actually a transition near the end. You'll see it when it happens where he basically transitions via lens flare. Loved it. I don't know if that was an intentional like F you to the people that hate him or whatever, but I loved it. I thought that was great. Uh, and, oh, for people that are wondering, is there a lot of slow motion action? Yes. Have you seen a Zack Snyder movie before? But I will say it feels smoother here than it has in a couple other films. I just feel like it, it found its rhythm between normal speed and Jam Woo speed, if that makes sense. Now I get to the big Mama Jamba. My man, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. After failing to defeat Aquaman the first time, Black Manta wields the power of the mythic Black Trident to unleash an ancient and malevolent force. Hoping to end his reign of terror, Aquaman forges an unlikely alliance with his brother Orm, the former king of Atlantis. You know, the bitchy one that was in prison at the end of the last one. Setting aside their differences, they join forces to protect their kingdom and save the world from an irreversible destruction. It's directed by James Wan. What? What? And was produced by Peter Safran, who now runs the DCU. Uh, they're gonna him and he and James Gunn are re kicking that baby off next. The film stars Jason Momoa. You know that, right? Woo! Yeah, that guy. He does a lot of woos. Patrick Wilson, Amber Heard, Nicole Kidman, and Yaya Abdul Mateen the second as Black Manta. Um, man, this is the end of the DCEU, the DC Extended Universe. This is the end. This is it. It's done. How do you feel about it? I mean, you're listening to this. Do you, do you have a, an opinion about this? Uh, you know what? I'll come back to the end of, the, of that. Let's let's talk about this movie. So in this film, you've got Aquaman becoming a father. He's a husband and a father. So it takes place years later. He's married to Mira. 
they have a little boy. They call him Junior a lot. Like he's always called Junior. And you get Aquaman doing the um, the dad duties quite often. And also referencing single fathers a lot. As if Mira's not there. And she is there, by the way. Amber Heard is part of this movie. Um, so that part is, is a little weird. It's The first act is a little long. Takes a while to get going. I think they're going for some, some cheap comedy. Aquaman drinks baby pee at least three times. Yeah, I think two or three times. That's an interesting choice, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. I mean, he, he's going through, like, normal dad stuff. I kind of like that they're taking that approach that, you know, he, sh- he, like, for instance, he's reenacting his time kicking some some goon's ass, some goon ass, and he uses action figures to demonstrate it while we cut back, cut between, you know, we're intercutting the actual fight that he had. I kind of, I kind of like that. I'm a, I'm a single, I was a single dad for a long time. I'm on board with it. (laughs) I don't know. I'm a sucker for it, I guess. I like that side of it, but it did get a little long and it got a little ridiculous, but you do get some, some wonderful bonding with his dad, uh, you know, because his dad was a single dad, but you know, because he was waiting for his mom, Atlanta to to come back or, or whatever. That's all sweet and fine, but it takes a while to get going. That's all I'm going to say about that. You get a villain that looks like Sauron from Lord of the Rings. I'm not making that up. It's WB. It could have been the same costume. I don't know. Anyway, character looks like Sauron. You don't really get much. It's a, it's hard to... Ah, I can't spoil it. I can't spoil it. I won't spoil it. The villain is really Black Manta. That Black Manta is the, the big villain. It feels like we've already done that, which I think takes away from this film quite a bit. Uh, I'm gonna t- I'm gonna take it in a couple different pieces here to kind of get through Aquaman. Overall, I was entertained. Okay, overall, I smiled a lot. Also, overall, I did not enjoy it as much as I enjoyed the first one. I really, really dug the first one. This was more of a a five out of ten, five and a half. It's it's an entertaining enough watch. It's a matinee. It's all right. I want to go see how this all ends. And then you go watch it. That's what it does. And it gives you a good, um, it gives you enough closure on the character to feel good about where it ends. So you can go into it knowing that, that you're getting enough out of it. So if you would never get another one, which I doubt you will of this particular actor in this particular role, because everybody wants him to be Lobo apparently now. And by the way, Jason Momoa went on the record, said he'd love to do it if they wanted him, but he has not had that phone call. Stop saying he's already committed. He has not. Anyway, I don't care about that. I'm talking about Aquaman. I like him as Aquaman. Man, he's the only guy that's ever made this character interesting to me. Uh! But overall, I enjoyed it enough. Jason Momoa makes the whole movie work. There are some things I have issues with, and I'm going to talk about those in a second. But overall, it's it's not nearly as bad as some people wanted to say. Now, it's not really good or very good. It's watchable. I know it's not a high compliment, but it's watchable. The special effects did not bother me most of the time. Uh, There's been some people that have complained and said the special effects were awful. I didn't find them that different from the first movie, and I I thought the special effects the first movie were amazing. I thought it was was a great film in terms of the, the effects. I don't feel the same here, but there are definitely uh, some some quality effects here. For instance, anyone who says the effects were awful, I can't take it seriously because Topo is amazing. Topo is basically his octopus sidekick. It's Aquaman's octopus sidekick. That effect is pretty flawless, and it's throughout the movie that he, this character is coming back to help him. It's very much like, you know... A, well, that's an octopus sidekick. And, you know, he's doing octopus stuff, but also really, really helps Aquaman out throughout the movie. Really helps get the job done, if you will. That That is all special effects. It's not like they had an octopus that they trained to follow him around, although that would be fantastic. Who wouldn't want a pet octopus? Apparently, they're very smart. So, anyway, that that's a special effect. Uh, a lot of the underwater stuff still works for me. There are some scenes where I'm like, okay, that doesn't work. And some of the costume choices are interesting. Like, I, I get Mira is a very attractive woman, but why are the boobs so out? I don't, I've never understood that in comic book stuff. Like, it just doesn't make any practical sense, but whatever. 
But Topo is a, a really good special effect and a good character. I really enjoy that character. So I had fun every time Topo was there. I would watch Topo movie. Make a spinoff, I'd watch Topo. Make it a silent one. Make John Woo do that. Do a silent movie with Topo. And we just get the squeaks and the noises. I think that would be fun. Nice and slimy and yeah, I would, I would watch that. But overall, I mean, there's a few times where I do think the special effects are a little clunky and obviously you can tell it's a rushed effort, but it's not often. I do think if you see it in 3D, because uh, two of the people I, I've talked to that complained about it saw it in 3D. I think that probably makes it pop a little bit more, right? It probably, maybe, maybe in the 3D rendering, it just doesn't work as well for whatever reason. But when it's flat on a normal screen, I had no problem with it whatsoever. So there you go. Nothing that blows your mind, but nothing that really took me out of it. And there's a lot of green everywhere. A lot of green. Because the idea is that Black Manta is messing with the environment enough to where it's causing an effect on a global scale. Which, isn't that that the plot of the last movie? I can't remember. I mean, they kind of blend together at this point, right? So anyway, that's the overall plot. And it's fine. I th- there, there's some some good set pieces. There's some fun fights. There's some good zipping around. Uh, Nicole Kidman gets in on the action. She gets to get some some ass kicking in. Um, and then there's this weird, really weird connection to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I don't know if I really don't know if this is kind of like a a way to say once and for all, hey, we've got no problem with Marvel. We really have no problem with Marvel, like we're we're both entities trying to do the same thing, make great comic book films, which this year has been very short in supply of. What have we got? Guardians 3, that's it, right? That's it. Lots of poo-poo. And I would say this is better than many of them. Quantumania sucked. I actually like the Marvels a lot, but you know, apparently I'm in the minority there. Uh, So there's just a lot of, the Flash went out in a flash in terms of audience. So anyway, so there's this weird connection because Randall Park is in here and you know, he's always popping in through the Marvel cinematic universe. So it is weird to see him. He's plays Dr. Stephen Chin in this movie and he's here throughout the film. And every time he pops up, I'm like, is this, am I in the wrong movie? Is this a multiverse thing? Is that what's going on here? Like he's actually part of the Marvel universe, but he's in the DC universe and they're just doing a, Hey, look, we can cross all lines. I don't know. But it was a, it was kind of a distracting, honestly. Um, there, there's a Loki reference in here. There's a reference, if you pay attention, which I'm sure you will, to the famous I am Iron Man uh, scene in Iron Man. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of, not a lot of, there's a few connections where it makes me wonder if this was a nod to Marvel to tip their hat and say, hey guys, no no problem here. I don't know. That's how it felt. Again, this is very much underwater Star Wars. Uh, you've got a whole scene where Martin Short is a CGI character that is really just an underwater job of the hut. The entire scene, there's, there's even singing and everything else. Like The whole thing is very uh, much job of the hut. It's the whole Return of the Jedi opening completely. Anyway, um, but the anchor here, once again, is Jason Momoa. I mean, he's definitely trying to act. There, there's some darker scenes he's trying to do. He's trying to make that orange and green suit work. God bless him. I'm glad they get it, uh, him out of it a few times because when he's in it, it's hard to take it seriously. He's lucky he's that cool. He is still as cool as hell. But man, that suit does no one, including Jason Momoa, any favors. So Patrick Wilson, they need his help. They need Orm's help to thwart this menace. And so they end up having to bust him out. And there's a whole jailbreak scene. A lot of fun. That scene was a lot of fun. And then a lot of the rest of the movie is them coming to terms with their relationship and where they are and who each one of them is in respect to their relationship. It's very 48 hours, lethal weapon kind of, you know, opposing mindsets and you know the whole cliche thing where they're coming together and they're getting a lot of retorts and riffs off each other for making fun of each other i like those I, i'm a sucker for buddy cop cliches okay so i'm telling you that right off the bat i am a complete and total sucker for buddy cop or buddy film cliches i love them i absolutely love them 
and they don't get quite uh, to the the top tier, but they're they're a good middle tier. Like these two bounce off each other well enough that I would put them in the last Boy Scout crowd. You know, they, they riff good enough. It leads to a lot of humor, and Patrick Wilson's a great actor, and he is freaking ripped. Like he has been hitting the gym. Jason Momoa must have been taking him. He didn't let him stay the whole time, obviously, because Momoa is twice his size. But Patrick Wilson is pretty ripped. <sighs> let me get to the Amber Heard of it all. I know that they're, God, here, I'll reflect on my 2023. I don't know if you remember this, but I wrote a review for her movie In the Fire, and I gave it a positive review, and I thought she did a very good job, and I got toasted on the internet. And a lot of people come to my defense, which was very nice, but also just toasted and roasted over that. I mean, man, I was, they did not think it was a good thing that I gave that <laughs> that movie a positive review. Uh, I don't care. It stands. It was, I liked it. I still, I still stand by that review. But anyway, so there's been a lot of talk about Amber Heard, right? And how much is she in there? Was she written out of the movie? Is she, uh, she needs to be out of here. Or I'm not going to go see it. People making that statement. It's, uh, both sides are very intense about how they feel about it. People that are on the ex's side are very intense that she better not be in this movie. People that are very much on her side and supporting women and whatnot are very much in, uh, well, she better not have been written out of the movie. It's neither. Okay. It's somewhere in the middle. She's here in the movie for 20 minutes as Mira. 20 minutes, I think is the the full count is what I saw. About 20 minutes, maybe 15. I think I totaled it at 11 lines she has. 11. And they're very basic. I mean, Mira is really a big part of the story. It's only a two hour movie. It's not one like a three hour epic, but it's like no one wants to invite her to dinner. It's weird. It's weird because she's there. I mean, there, there are scenes where she's sitting right next to Aquaman on the throne. She's holding their baby. There's a lot of scenes where it's Aquaman and his dad, uh, Tom Curry, you know, sitting around their house having father-son conversations, and Mira's nowhere to be found. They don't even really explain where Mira went. Like, where the hell is she? Who's watching this baby? Are you guys paying any attention to this kid? Well, yeah, of course, because Aquaman's taking care of this kid while he's taking care of the kingdom, and he's, you know, trying to work-life balance. Which, by the way, I should say, I do like that they approach the dad side of that, because as a single dad, which he's not a single dad, but they keep kind of alluding to him being a single dad, whatever. As a single dad... I get tired of movies only representing single working moms because there are single working dads. I being one of them and I did it with two kids. And let me tell you, it is hard as hell to be a single parent and never see it reflected. So I, I do appreciate that Aquaman got an extra bump just for that, like a fist bump and a love bump. And that, that sounded dirty. Okay. Back to Amber Heard. So she's in it, but it feels, but it, it's just, it's almost distracting because it's like they didn't want to give her much to do. And I'm sure they're worried about backlash because of the whole, that whole trial thing. <sighs> you know, we try to stay away from that whole, from gossip and, and that kind of nonsense. It, but when it hurts the movie, it hurts the movie. And this hurts the movie. She deserved to get more to do. She was a big part of the first movie. If you're going to have her in it, give her more to do or recast her. Because the way that they handled it, I thought was really piss poor. Really do. I think that was handled very poorly. And I'm a big fan of James Wan, man. I, I love James Wan. Maybe it wasn't even his call. It's probably a studio cut. And they wanted to keep her her role to a minimum. But she's not in it minimally. It's just when she's there, it doesn't feel like she's there. And it's just so odd. It's just odd. So anyway, if you like Aquaman, you'll like Aquaman too. You're not going to like it as much as Aquaman. That was a really a, a great DCEU movie. That's one of the better ones. I mean, it's under Wonder Woman, but it's a, it's one of the better ones. And yeah, so if $10 is the full price of mission, I would give Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom probably five bucks, five fifty if I'm being, I'll, I'll give that for the love bump, right? Five fifty. That's what you get for that single dad motif. I really liked it, but um, could have been better. I mean, if you're going to end the DCEU, and if you didn't know, and I'm sure who listening to this doesn't know this, but James Gunn and Peter Safran are taking over for DC. They're doing a full reboot. For a time, it really seemed like they might keep a couple of them. Like if Aquaman would have done well, they would have kept him. Uh, they might have kept Michael Keaton if The Flash did well. I, I know Gal Gadot thought she was getting more Wonder Woman. I 
I don't see that happening. In fact, I see the main Justice League getting a full reboot. So that brings me to the end of this particular episode. And what does that mean? I mean, did it go out with the with the bang, or did it just? Yeah, that's kind of how it went out with the fizzle. Blue Beetle sticking around because that wasn't technically part of the DCEU, I guess. Um, Peacemaker sticking around. No word on Harley Quinn because that that's a there's a weird um, dynamic there because the Suicide Squad has to count. Not Suicide Squad, the Suicide Squad. Well, but Margot Robbie was in that as Harley Quinn because that has Peacemaker in it. Peacemaker still stands. That show's coming back. If that counts, then Harley Quinn still has to count. I don't know how that's going to work. But for the but the Justice League is gone, right? Henry Cavill, Ben Affleck, uh, Ray Fisher, Gal Gadot, Jason Momoa, Ezra Miller, they're gone. I had a feeling Ezra Miller wasn't coming back anyway. I mean, he had uh, very similar Jonathan Major-esque stuff happen. Oh, and I've heard some people say, like, well, how come Ezra Miller got his movie? His movie's already shot and done. They had spent like $300 million on it. It was getting released no matter what. Uh, Jonathan Majors hasn't filmed any more of his Kang portion, so it's pretty easy for them to move on from him. And I'm sure they have a morality clause in their contract, so they can get out of that pretty easy. Back to the DCEU. You know, overall, if you think about it, my, my overall thoughts are if you care. But really, I'm just going to keep talking to get... Because the people that are make to the end, I really, 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 I'm going to give a little code word so I know they made it to the end. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's going to be a code word when I get there. Because I'm not taking a, I don't want to do a hundred shots or a thousand shots. My God, it killed me. Um, so Zach Miller's Snyderverse, I don't think that's ever really a fair uh, assessment of this universe. Now, he was put kind of in charge of it, but he's also been out of it for several years. And this has been going on for 10 years now, right? So this is this is done. 10 years, done. Uh, Man of Steel, I thought, was a good film. I really like Man of Steel. Batman versus Superman, theatrical was decent. Jesse Eisenberg, one of, him and, he and Je- Jared Leto were the worst casting DC has ever done. In any form. In any form. I don't think Holly Berry is that bad. Sorry. Um but the theatrical cut wasn't nearly as good as the ultimate cut. And I'll just never understand why they didn't do the ultimate cut to begin with, because we can handle a three hour movie. Lord of the Rings had already had three of them out and did fantastic business. And if you're going to have two of the most top shelf superhero characters in the height of the comic book world, uh, film them, give them all the time you can, man. Don't cut their time short. I don't The movie is much better if you see the three-hour cut. Martha, dear God, was horrible. Martha was horrible. Ben Affleck was great as, as Bruce Wayne. I have no problems with him or Henry Cavill or Gal Gadot or Jason Momoa. Um, Ray Fisher was so much better in Zack Snyder's Justice League, the full four-hour version. Like You got to see how much how capable of an actor he is. And then you get um, Ezra Miller. I never really loved as Flash, but he wasn't bad. I mean, it was it was actually pretty decent in the Zack Snyder versions. Um, just became a little unbearable as it went on. But it's hard because it's hard to separate the person from the from the story sometimes for for some people. I get it. Um, some of those some of those movies were just ill advised, and I, you get the feeling when you watch the DCEU that it started to be run by committee. Like it wasn't being, nobody had a real vision. I think James Wan had a vision for the first Aquaman. I feel like um, Patty Jenkins had a clear vision for the first Wonder Woman. Like that, those things seemed obvious because they didn't feel like such committee movies. And then their sequels both felt like committee movies. And what I mean by that is a bunch of studio heads saying with, you know, handing out notes saying, cut this, do this, make sure we get an extra hero, make sure we get an extra set piece, make sure that this happens, you know, reshoot, reshoot, whatever. It just felt like a mess, you know, because it wasn't consistent. Oh, birds of prey. I like birds of prey a lot. I think birds of prey is a really good movie. Um, you know, there was just too much. uh, They were rushing it too much. Batman versus Superman. They both should have got, tell me if you guys agree. 
Man of Steel deserved a sequel. Ben Affleck deserved his own solo Batman movie, probably directed by him. He's a fantastic director. Um, but that neither happened. I heard his script for his Batman solo movie was stellar. I would have loved to have seen that. I bet you it would have been better than Matt Reeves' version. Yeah, I said it. Um, you know, the movie where it's three hours long. Well, then we can do three-hour movies, apparently. But we can't do it when you got two of the biggest heroes of all time, plus Wonder Woman. What are you thinking, DC? <sighs> Well, they have new people in, involved. I don't know what that means for the future, but it became it became convoluted, a bit messy. But I liked overall. I loved the casting. I I thought the, the heroes they cast were wonderful. Um, I really preferred that they were aesthetically different from Marvel. Marvel is a little too jokey sometimes and a little too hee hee, and DC kept it more serious most of the time. But they could. You know, when you got the spit, the ones that weren't Zack Snyder had a lot of levity to them. Well, Wonder Woman films, both of them had a lot of levity. Uh, Aquaman, both movies had a lot of jokes and humor and Momoa really, you know, threw his, his flavor around. Like, so there were even Ben Affleck when he was allowed to, he had some, some good jokes. Uh, Superman was really kind of short changed cause he, they never really got to the Clark Kent of it all. And that's a really important part. I agree of, of Superman is to have those two opposing personalities. But anyway, so I'm. You know, rest in peace, DCEU. I mean, I'm still going to have those movies. I'm going to rewatch several of them. Um, probably won't rewatch Suicide Squad much because Jared Leto just kills that movie. So horrible. He and Jesse Eisenberg should be serving time for their Lex Luthor and the Joker performances. You know what I mean? Like, they're, I'm thinking, yeah, I think they should serve time. I really do. Wild. Anyway, that's what I think of it. It's it's sad because I really feel like we should be gutted more as fans. I, I really liked a lot of those movies. I loved a lot of pieces of those movies, but I didn't love a lot of the entirety of those movies. And that's probably what the problem is. But I really dug the casting. I feel like they still could have salvaged the casting and made another Superman, Wonder Woman, and, and Batman movie. And it would have been great. I think if they would have, you could have had James Gunn involved and resurrected all of it and made it all work, but they went a different way. That's fine. That's the right, but it's over. Stop trying to restore it. I don't want to see it restored on Netflix. I don't want to re see it restored on max. If we're going to move on, I want to move on. I already think it's idiotic that we're, we're kind of changing course because if you didn't hear my God, we're still in convolutionville. James Gunn just announced that Matt Reeves is doing an Arkham Asylum show on max that's still set in the normal dc the new dcu but his movie the batman movies are not his penguin show is not but this arkham show will be pick a side man <laughs> like i'm tired of this they seem to have the hardest time making this seamless and i don't know i'm trying to trust in gun but i still say james gunn killed the dcu DCEU slate this year by announcing it so early in the year that it was dead. Because once you did that, people empath emphatically said, I'm done with this universe. I had friends say it. I had fans say it all year long. I have to, I'll wait till it's streaming because what's it matter? Why waste money? It doesn't matter anymore. You know, and you can look at the returns. You look at all the returns. Marvel had the same, had a similar problem, but there's are more of too much, too much quantity. Quantity over quality. That's their problem. Anyway, that's the end of the DCEU. You know what? I, I still thank Zack Snyder for, for bringing those characters to life and giving me the movies I got and giving me a, a much edgier, oh, I like that word, right? A little edgier um, take on comic book heroes, making them feel like gods, making them feel mythical, bigger than all of us. I, I, really, I really appreciated that. Uh, finally getting... Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman that was casting I didn't see coming which worked beautifully Ben Affleck was a wonderful Bruce Wayne and Batman I love Henry Cavill he finally got to shine in the four-hour Justice League which is a fantastic opus of a film um, Jason Momoa has been great as Aquaman I'm sorry I'm, I'm gonna miss him too but I won't miss Ezra that much and Ray Fisher didn't get a lot to do so I'll be fine with the other two gone but I'm gonna miss those four and I'm going to miss Margot Robbie if she doesn't come back to it. Now they, she said she would, but I don't know if, 
if she's going to, I don't know. You know what? Let's, let's wrap this up. Thanks everybody for listening. And remember if you made it this far and you reach out on social media and share this episode and you use a special word, right? Here's the special word. I don't know. What should the special word be? It's got to be something that you wouldn't think I would say. Here you go. Phrase. Where's the Tylenol? Feels apropos for this time of year, right? Where's the Tylenol? So you share this show and you say, you know, watch this episode, made it to the end. Aaron's got to do a shot. Where's the Tylenol? I will do a shot for every one of those I see on social media. All right. Make sure you tag the Hollywood Outsider and share it on your social media outlets. So you could give me the most aggressive hangover I've ever had in my life if you want to. That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening. You made it this far. I can't believe it. I have been talking for over an hour. My God, my head hurts. You know what? The next time you go to the theater or stream comfortably from your couch, be sure you buy popcorn. I'm going to go. My head hurts. Where's the Tylenol? Take care, all of you.